Uh, hello everyone, my name is David Ha. Uh, today I'll be presenting improved process-based streamflow simulation through ensemble and stochastic data-driven approaches. This is the work that I've been doing uh, during my master's for the last two years, and I thought that uh, this may be interesting for many of you guys, uh, so I decided to volunteer for this uh, Lunch and Learn. Uh, the idea here is uh, we have our uh, streamflow uh, simulation through our process-based hydrological model, and we want to improve that ba based on using uh, data-driven approaches. That's the general idea. And let's do pointers. Uh, to give you a background of the presentation, hydrological modeling emerged to better understand the complexities of water movement on Earth for applications such as water management, hydraulic designs, and flood forecasting. The rational method was the first of its kind proposed over 150 years ago, and it is still used today to estimate peak discharge for drainage systems. And uh, of course, the computer revolution in the 1960s allowed hydrologists to devise process-based hydrological models and data-driven models, both of which may require high computational cost or large volumes of data. Process-based hydrological models attempt to simplify the hydrological process through the perceived response of the catchment from rainfall, and data-driven models estimate statistical relationships between explanatory and response variables using historical measurements. And to give you an example, uh, hydrogeosphere would be uh, within the category of process-based hydrological models, and uh, models like the machine learning models would be under data-driven models. And fairly recently in the uh, 2010s, deep learning models, which is within the category of data-driven models, are now computationally feasible. What's interesting about deep learning models is that it has shown to have similar or better predictive capabilities than process-based hydrologic models. Although these two approaches, HMs and DDMs, have primarily advanced independently, there is an increasing interest in combining these approaches to have predictive performance beyond what is achievable by the individual models. Since then, hydrologists have uh, proposed various combined approaches, although they have different naming conventions. The classification that I give here does not serve to be an exhaustive list, but it is a starting point to differentiate the different approaches given in the literature. First, we have the informed approach. This is a general method of informing your data-driven models with relevant theoretical knowledge. For example, uh, in this case here, P, air, uh, precipitation P and air temperature T are given as inputs to the hydrological model along with its model parameters data and its corresponding outputs, Y or stream flow is given as inputs to the data-driven model along with its input data to give us a refined output for stream flow big Y. Or in this case here, we extract information from your data-driven models to be used within your process-based equation. In this example, uh, in this example the, uh, we extract the model parameters from the data-driven model to be used within your hydrological model. Next, we have the constrained approach. This is related to adding physical equations to the loss function of a data-driven model. The loss functions consist of the standard loss function, for example, the mean squared error. This is the uh, standard loss function that we typically use in the uh, machine learning algorithms. Or, and then we have the residuals of the governing equation, for example, the Richards equation, the residuals of the initial condition, and the boundary conditions all scale with the weight term lambda to update the model parameters. Finally, we have the error approach. The error approach is related to your data-driven model simulating the residual of your hydrological model, and the residual is given by the difference between the observed stream flow Q and the simulated stream flow Y. Uh, this is the target variable for the data-driven model, and its corresponding outputs, R, or the hydrological model residual, is then summed up with the hydrological model simulation to give us a, a refined output for stream flow big Y. What's interesting about this approach is that it can enable stochasticity. Why is this important? We first have to discuss the uncertainty in hydrological simulations. Estimating the uncertainty quantifies the reliability of the model. In other words, it questions the model's confidence in the simulations. And there are different forms of uncertainties. For example, there are uncertainties related to your input data, the uncertainty related to your model parameters, or the model error uncertainty. And the model error uncertainty is especially useful since it takes into account of all the uncertainties that are not explicitly accounted for. And one way to quantify these uncertainties is to use a blueprint to convert deterministic to stochastic models using the model error distribution. And recall that the error approach that I mentioned a slide ago can estimate the hydrological model error using data-driven models. As such, my supervisor, Professor Quilty, and uh, Dr. Sukhor Sassanana from the University of Zurich developed the conceptual data-driven approach, or the CDDA, where each member of the ensemble hydrological model, YI, is paired with the data-driven model which simulates the residuals, RI. 
This is then summed up together to give us a refined output for stream flow, big Y. The limitation of this approach is that it only accounts for the uncertainty related to the model parameters. In other words, the CDDA uses the expectation, not the distribution of the model errors. So the follow-up study proposed the stochastic CDDA or the SCDDA to account for various sources of uncertainties not included in the original CDDA. The SCDDA uses the uh, blueprint to convert deterministic stochastic models given by this equation, where F represents the public density function, X theta, E and Q are the input data model parameters, model error and stream flow, and finally S is the deterministic model. The caveat of this approach was that HMs were used as inputs to the data-driven model, which is the informed approach, not the same approach as in the CDDA, which uses the error approach. This can be quite problematic since the SCDDA is not quantifying the uncertainty of the CDDA. And if we want to compare the performance of the CDDA and SCDDA, we have to train our data-driven models using two different approaches, one using the informed, the other using the error, uh, which can be computationally expensive. So here, I propose a new SCDDA, which takes advantage of the multiple parameter sets generated by the CDDA and can similarly take into account various sources of uncertainties, not including the original uh, SCDDA, by assimilating the hydrological model residuals within a stochastic framework. In other words, the SCDA that I propose here serves as a second stage in post-processing, where you first use the data-driven model to correct for the residuals of the hydrological model, and then use the stochastic framework to convert our CDDA into the stochastic CDDA. It should be noted that this research has recently been uh, published in environmental modeling and software and is available for open access. The objectives of this research is to apply the CDDA and USCD for different combinations of HMs and DDMs, compare the performance of the CDDA and SCDDA, and finally propose and explore the use of a diagnostic tool to predict if the SCDDA can improve upon the reliability of the CDDA. The study area uses the same catchments used in the previous studies, the Duner and Kleinem and Mota catchments uh, located in Switzerland. These are all medium-sized mountainous catchments ranging from 234 to 478 kilometers squared. And the dominant flood types are rainfall for Duner and rainfall and snowmelt for Kleinem and Mota catchments. Since the goal of this research is to simulate the stream flow at the catchment outlet at daily time steps, all relevant hydrological variables are catchment averaged. Uh, since the research focuses on the data-driven models, I'll, I'll give you a really quick overview of the hydrological model. Uh, the first hydrological model is HPV Lite. This is uh, the same model that was used in the previous studies, which is based on the HPV model structure. Next, we have the TUW model, which is another HPV-based hydrological model chosen specifically due to its similarities with HPV Lite, and the differences are given in this list. And finally, we have the GR4J, which is a parsimonious hydrological model consisting of four total parameters, chosen due to its simplicity in terms of the model structure compared to the other HPV-based models. The first data-driven model I'll introduce is extreme gradient boosting. Extreme gradient boosting is a tree-based machine learning approach where each tree within the XGB are combined sequentially and scaled according to a learning rate to minimize the simulations of residuals made by prior trees. In short, extreme gradient boosting provides a parsimonious model through various regularization methods compared to the standard gradient boosting to assist in the bias variance trade-off. Next, we have random forest. Random forest is another tree-based machine learning approach where you first create a bootstrap data set by randomly selecting samples from the training data with a replacement, create a decision tree based on a random subset of the variables at each root and node of the tree, repeat these steps multiple times and average all the predictions. It is the diversity of the trees generated by the random forest that assists in the bias variance trade-off. Finally, we have the long short-term memory networks or the LSTM. Uh, the strength, the LSTM is a deep learning model based on the recurrent neural network. The strength of the LSTM is that it can learn long-term dependencies. This is especially useful since persistence is commonly found in hydrological variables and is able to learn these long-term dependencies through a cell state and multiple gates that control the flow of information from the network, as shown by this diagram. And I chose long-term term memory networks in the study because of its uh, prominence in hydrological simulations involving deep learning and recent applications. For the model setup, uh, the HPV Lite genetic algorithm Powell using KGE as the objective function. This is the same setup used in the previous studies. The two W model and GR4J use Bayesian optimization with Gaussian processes. It should be noted that Bayesian optimization is a popular approach to tuning data-driven model hyperparameters and is known for finding suitable parameter sets with low model evaluations. By using this under hydrological models, however, we expect that the QW model and GR4J will not have the same level of performance as HPV Lite, 
but by providing suitable parameter sets, not necessarily optimal, it may give the opportunity for the CDDA and SCDDA to correct these undercalibrated hydrological models and enable reliable simulations. The data-driven models use Bayesian optimization to tune the model hyperparameters with time length inputs up to nine days of the 30 or 20 model iterations per ensemble of the hydrological model. Here are the steps used for the stochastic simulation. For new input data, we randomly select a data, uh, hydrological model parameter to generate a hydrological model simulation. Given that hydrological model parameter, we randomly select a data-driven model parameter to generate a data-driven model simulation. The hydrological model and data-driven model simulations are summed together, which is a CDA. And a CDDA model error is picked up at random from the validation set using k-nearest neighbors and added to the CDDA simulation. Repeat these steps multiple times to generate an estimate of FQ. It should be noted that if we get rid of the data-driven model components within this algorithm, we can convert our hydrological model into the stochastic hydrological model as given by the original blueprint paper. At this stage, you may be wondering what the difference is between ensemble and stochastic simulations. Adopting the definitions provided by Leo and Tamiya in 2007, ensemble simulations measure a subset of the uncertainty of a response variable. Uh, for example, the, only the uncertainty related to the model parameters or uh, simply the uncertainty related to the input data. Uh, meanwhile, stochastic simulations estimate the prediction uncertainty of a response variable. In this case here, we use the model error distribution to uh, get the prediction uncertainty since the model error distribution takes into account of all the uncertainties that are not explicitly accounted for. Because we have these two simulation types, I define confidence intervals as the intervals given by the ensemble simulations and prediction intervals are the uh, intervals given by the stochastic simulations as given by this diagram. For the performance assessment, the deterministic performance uses the mean of the ensemble and stochastic simulations given by these metrics, and I want to focus more on the probabilistic performance, where you first have average width. This is the 95% prediction interval average across the time series, which measures the sharpness of the simulations. Next, we have the alpha index, which is related to the area between the coverage probability plot and the bisector line, which measures the reliability of the simulations. And finally, we have the mean continuous rank probability score, which is related to the area between the cumulative distribution function of the uh, simulated stream flow and the observed stream flow, uh, which measures both simulation sharpness and reliability into one metric. For the experiments, I compare the performance of the ensemble and stochastic models and then compare the validation test set coverage probability plots to see uh, which ones uh, have the better reliability. I check out the effect of ensemble size of model performance to see if it is possible to reduce the computational demand. And uh, finally, I check the snow versus no snow routine in a hydrologic model to see if the SCDD is capable of fixing for hydrologic processes missing from the hydrologic model. Here are the results for the standalone hydrologic model, the left tables for the deterministic performance and the right tables for the probabilistic performance. Uh, starting off in the left table, we see that HPV light shows superior deterministic performance with lower MAE RMSC and higher NSC and KG values compared to the other hydrologic models. Uh, despite its high strong, uh, strong deterministic performance, HPV light shows uh, poor reliability where alpha index equal to one represents perfect uniformity against the observed stream flow. However, we see 0.59, 0.78, and 0.58. Despite its poor reliability, the CRPS is still better than the other hydrological models. If you compare the performance of the TUW model in GL4J against HPV light using NSC as an example, for the Deuteron and Klein M catchments, the NSC levels are relatively similar. However, the models calibrated using Bayesian optimization are underperforming in the motor catchment. It should be noted that the TUW model had a consistent problem with the model bias, which we can see here. And uh, next we have the uh, results for the CDDA. I will omit the deterministic performance table. Uh, however, it should be noted that all CDDA variants had a KGE above 0.8 to 0.91, and the TUW model bias reduced to 3.2% compared to the uh, 15 to 20% that we saw previously. If you look at the probabilistic performance of the CDDA variants, uh, using H, uh, looking at HPV light, firstly, uh, the alpha index is still consistently performing poorly. And what's interesting here is that HPV light no longer has the best CRPS performance. In fact, other uh, CDDA variants have shown to have good reliability in some cases, for example, 0 0.93, 0 0.92, and 0.94 for the two W model variants in the Deuter catchment. Uh, the most interesting thing about the uh, CDDA probabilistic performance table is that the CRPS improved by 18 to 69% from the standalone hydrological model. Finally, we have the results for the SCDDA. The top table is the same table that we saw previously, 
and the bottom tables for the stochastic models. If we look at HPV light once again, we see that the alpha index improves from an average of 0.79 to an average of 0.92 and overall improving the CRPS. However, it should be noted that the stochastic framework did not always improve upon its reliability. For example, the alpha index decreases from 0.92 to 0.79 from the CDDA into the SCDDA. Uh, in fact, the analysis showed that if you have an ensemble model with uh, high reliability, for example, alpha index greater than 0.85, then the stochastic framework is not able to improve uh, no longer improve upon the reliability, actually deteriorates in performance. And if we have an ensemble model with lower reliability, I'll find this less than 0.85, the stochastic framework tends to improve upon its reliability, and the models that did improve the reliability, the CRPS tends to maintain or improve performance. Uh, to give you an example, this is the Dooner and Cashman for the test set in the year 2014, where blue represents the 95% confidence or prediction intervals for the ensemble and stochastic hydrological model, and orange represents the 95% confidence or prediction intervals for the CTDA and SCTDA. If you look at an example on the top right hand corner, HPV light LSTM CTDA, we see that the ensemble models are not able to capture the high flow events that are occurring between July and August. However, the stochastic variance of those models in the figure underneath, the 95% prediction intervals are able to capture those high flow events. And the difference between the uh, stochastic hydrological model and the SCDDA is that the stochastic hydrological model tends to have a larger prediction interval as demonstrated by the TUW model variance and the GL4J variance, uh, the difference between the blue and the orange here. Next, we have the coverage probability plot for the Duner and Cashman for the validation of test sets. Uh, first thing to notice is that ensemble hydrologic models that show sharp simulations, given by this S uh, characteristic curve, uh, tends to have the uh, CDDAs that also have sharp simulations as well. And the CDDAs that lie close to the bisector have their corresponding SCDAs that are less reliable. This is the same result that we saw previously in the tables, uh, just showing in terms of the coverage probability plot. And the most uh, interesting thing about the coverage probability plot is that all simulations from the stochastic framework either have large simulations or reliable simulations. And since reliable and conservative simulations are of high importance for many water resource applications, the stochastic framework may be a useful, uh, may be a useful tool. Next, I checked the effect of ensemble size on model performance to see if it is possible to reduce uh, the computational demand by reducing the number of ensemble members. On the y-axis, we have average width. On the x-axis, we have ensemble size. The left column are for the ensemble models and the right column are stochastic models. Uh, over here, we see that ensemble models calibrated using Bayesian optimization are fluctuating. This is likely caused by uh, Bayesian optimization looking for diverse parameter sets. For the stochastic model, the average width is stabilizing beyond 25 ensemble members. However, there is an inflection point that occurs at around 40 members. The cause for this is unknown. However, the performance difference between 100 and 200 members is relatively small. Uh, next, we have the effect of ensemble size on reliability. Uh, this is the same figure, except the y-axis is now reliability. The, the uh, ensemble models, the reliability for the ensemble models are uh, stabilizing beyond 50 members uh, for most cases. And for the stochastic models, the uh, reliability increases to approximately 15 members and slowly stabilizes by 100 members. The instability of the alpha index for lower ensemble members may be due to poor characterization of the uncertainty as demonstrated by the stabilization that occurs around 100 members. Finally, we have the effect on CRPS and decomposed metrics for the Duner attachment. The potential CRPS is the CRPS that we would get if you had perfectly reliable simulations, and it is sensitive to the sharpness of the simulations. The reliability CRPS is the reliability component of the CRPS. And the overall CRPS is a summation of the potential reliability CRPS. And we use these metrics to see how much simulation sharpness and reliability contribute to the overall CRPS. The most interesting thing about this figure is that uh, for the ensemble models, reliability is a significant portion of the overall CRPS. And for the stochastic models, the potential CRPS contributes greatly to the overall CRPS with minimal contribution from the reliability CRPS. The reliability CRPS for the stochastic models are all between 0 and 0 0.05, uh, suggesting that the stochastic framework has a tendency to convert ensemble models into more reliable models at the cost of simulation sharpness. Finally, uh, the GL4J does not incorporate a snow routine. 
despite two of the three catchments having snow as an important hydrological process. Therefore, the Senate managed snow routine is coupled with the GeoFJ to see if there's a performance difference between the SCDDAs. However, I found negligible differences with COPS difference less than 0.02 and alpha index difference less than 0.03, suggesting that this stochastic, uh, the SCDDA may have the potential to correct hydrological processes absent from the hydrological model, however, require larger experiments with additional catchments to confirm these results. In conclusion, uh, hydrological modelers that already have their ensemble hydrological model can use any of these techniques that I mentioned to improve in an attempt to improve the simulation performance. If they are hesitant in applying this approach, the coverage probability plot can be used to check if it is worth the computational investment. The CDD and SCD may occur for hydrological processes absent from the hydrological model, but we require large experiments with additional catchments to confirm these results. For my recommendations, uh, because we already have the uh, Hydrogeos for a real-time platform, but we could always uh, use any of these techniques, the uh, stochastic framework to convert our HGS into the stochastic hydrological model, or use the data-driven model to correct for the errors of the uh, hydrological model to become the CDDA, or we apply the stochastic framework on top of the CDDA to convert it into the SCDDA. And we could use the coverage probability plus to check if it is uh, capable of improving the simulation performance. Uh, thank you. That was all for me. I'm happy to take your questions now.